next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. It is time to drop the curtain on the TSA Security Theater. We've got that story plus terror drill propaganda just in time for the summer. But first, in a presidential first, Obama will visit Hiroshima to, quote, pay respects. The Guardian reported survivors of the U.S. atomic bombing of Hiroshima have welcomed Barack Obama's upcoming visit to the city, while media reports claimed Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was considering a reciprocal trip to Pearl Harbor. The White House said Obama, who will become the first sitting U.S. president to visit Hiroshima, will pay his respects to the 140,000 people who died after the U.S. dropped an atomic bomb on the morning of August 6, 1945. He will not, however, offer an apology. Japanese officials have not demanded an apology, preferring to frame Obama's visit on May 27th as a catalyst for more global action on non-proliferation and disarmament. Any hints of contrition from Obama would risk inviting more international scrutiny of Japan's own record on wartime apologies under Abe, a conservative who has said that today's Japanese should not be predestined to apologize for atrocities committed in the first half of the century. Now, James, former President Jimmy Carter went when he was out of office in 1984, and we do know that John Skull and Bones Kerry went just last month for what he described as a, quote, gut-wrenching visit. So we'll include links to more, and this basically surrounds the 42nd G7 Summit that's coming up, James, May 26th through the 27th. That's right. And yes, it is gut-wrenching. If you do go there and if you go through the museum, as I have many times, it is a gut-wrenching experience to think of all of those lives that were vaporized in an instant and to, to see some of the artifacts of that. Um, as any non-psychopathic human being would be, I think it, it's a gut-wrenching emotional experience. Um, obviously, that's not really what Obama's th- going to be there for. Uh, he's going to burnish his credentials as the you know world savior, the man who started the ball rolling on the end, ending nukes, although he's done absolutely nothing whatsoever towards that during his administration, but he can still say that he did. Oh, he's a Nobel Peace Prize winner and he went to Hiroshima. That'll be part of his legacy, which he's trying to burnish now in the final year of his sitting duck presidency. And Abe gets to probably use this as some sort of uh, a part of the the Japanese kind of revision of history. And, uh, you know, I mean, oh, poor us. I mean, yes, I am 100 percent on the side of the people who think that the bomb should not have been dropped on civilian targets like that. But um, but Abe is going to use it in the apology politics game that goes on in East Asia. And, uh, and you know, it's part of the deflection of what uh, the Imperial Japanese did. So they both get their little political prize out of this. It has nothing to do with really honoring the dead or whatever, whatever, you know, even if they lay a wreath at the, the, the cenotaph or whatever, it's still going to be all show, all showbiz. Um, so we shouldn't expect anything of that. The G7 is in town, almost literally for me here. Um, next week, there's going to be a, one of those pre, kind of pre-meetings of certain ministers is going to be in the next town over. And that kind of nonsense is going on all month here. Um, But I'm not expecting anything particularly ground-shaking or earth-breaking to come out of it. I will be keeping my eye on the local media here and see if anything comes out, um, and I'll let you know if it does. Obama definitely seems like he's on his sort of victory lap, and he'll have these things that, again, you can kind of chalk up as like, oh my god, he got got Cuba, he went to Hiroshima. It's this, you know kind of fun tour in a way and i you know love love the irony in this article that notes about of course the global action on non-proliferation and disarmament as though the west wasn't the biggest armament of armies all around the world not necessarily nuclear as though they're probably referring to here but of course again it's 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 base, but it's it's ironic. I can get a hoot out of it, James. <laughs> Our second story this week comes submitted to us via Twitter using hashtag New World Next Week at Sean Cathcart as the U.S. U.S. rather carried out yet another bioterror experiment using non toxic gas. This was on the New York subway, James. As Russia Today reported, the U.S. government examines how a poisonous chemical attack might impact the New York subway system by releasing non-toxic particles and gas into train stations during operating hours. Since Monday, this past Monday, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has, by its own admission, been releasing bursts of inert and harmless gases into one of the busiest transport networks in the world. It's part of a detailed study to replicate what might happen if terrorists ever unleashed chemicals like sarin or chlorine gas into the metro. For at least five days, so people in New York are literally 
soaking in it right now, probably. Two out of three stations, including Grand Central, Times Square, and Penn Station, are being gassed as commuters go about their business. The experiment is aimed at observing airflow patterns and improving bioterrorism security within the sprawling New York City tunnel system, which, James, if I'm not mistaken, has actually been around for over 100 years. I would wager they know how the air works in 100-plus-year-old tunnels. I think, like we talked about a few weeks ago, torture being a message, and it's sending the message to the plebes, I think we see the terror drills again are always kind of sending that big huge message to the plebe. So I, I've got some other related stories here, James, but I just want to throw this one back to you. These things in a lot of ways are sort of, we were joking before we started to roll this, this is kind of a classic New World Next Week, as terror drills have kind of been that central part of sort of the post 9-11 terror world. Yeah. And I think there are three layers to this particular onion. There's the first layer of the ostensible test, which as you point out, these hundred year tunnel, hundred year old tunnels, they can, I mean, they already have enough data, I'm sure, to be able to model this. And if not, they can do mock-ups and other types of simulations without actually releasing gases in the New York subway. So I think that layer is, uh, I mean, an outright tissue of lies. The second layer would be well, you know, they could use this as a cover for some sort of false flag attack. Well, they could, but they wouldn't advertise this so widely if it was going to be like that. It would be some sort of super secret experiment that you never hear about that suddenly becomes this. Um, the third layer of this is, as I think you intimated when you covered this on Morning Monarchy, it's basically the test to see how people react to this type of thing. You know, how do people react when these gases are being, when they know that they're being gassed in the New York subway? Don't worry, it's inert, it's harmless, nothing's going to happen. Just go about your daily routine. Um, you know, it, I think it's more about the psychological ramifications of that. And that's so much of what these terror drills of the past 15 years have been about, is indoctrinating people to expect terror is always around the corner. We have to be vigilant and ready because, you know, those terrorists, those uh, towel-headed boogeymen are all, you know, hiding around in the, uh, slouching around in the subways, and we've got to be careful, and everybody's a suspect. I think that's ultimately the, the aim of this. But as I say, it's a three-layer onion at least. So I'll actually I'll, I'll have another headline about sort of the paranoia that all of this instills a little later in this episode. But thank you. I did. I did talk about that this Monday on the Morning Monarchy, the morning show that I do, where I also actually talked about another bunch of terror drills that were going on this week in the UK. And that was the. What do they call them? The Winchester Accord terror drills, where at some point, actually, after they were over and done with, the cops had to apologize that they had their stereotypical terrorist yell, Alu Akbar. So we'll include links to that, James, that have some pretty ridiculous photos for you to check out from the sort of terror theater drill. And also background links to some of the other times that alphabet agencies have conducted experiments on the people like Operation Big City. So as we reach our third and final segment this week on episode 268 of New World Next Week, via CBS News, flyers, patients at breaking point over long lines. Airports in New York and New Jersey are joining a growing course of complaints about the long wait times at airport security, saying TSA staffing isn't keeping up with increased passenger traffic. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey wrote a letter to the Transportation Security Administration saying, quote, the patience of the flying public has reached a breaking point. We can no longer tolerate the continuing inadequacy of TSA passenger screening services, end quote. The Port Authority says it might implement a plan already under consideration in Atlanta and Seattle where officials could hire outside help contracting with private security companies. The TSA said it's working to decrease passenger wait times by using canines to expedite screenings, asking Congress to approve overtime pay and speeding up the hiring process to bring on new officers. So, James, their answer to the bureaucracy is no, 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 we need maybe some more bureaucracy. And aside from having, you know, drug dogs run around you all of the time, I think this is an interesting note. And, and, James, I guess I'll throw it back to you in the form of a question. When this kind of thing starts to come out, doesn't this just sort of embolden the alphabet agencies to foil one of their own busts to say, look, no, you totally need us? Yes, exactly. I mean, I'm surprised there hasn't been more of that going on in the last several years. Instead, we've had all of those reports of 
people successfully smuggling things through TSA uh-huh. over and over again. And, uh, and so th- we know that it's security theater. We know more importantly that it's not just security theater. It is a psychological operation aimed at training the prisoners to be prisoners. It's sheep herding 101. It's cattle wrestling 101. It's take off your shoes and your belt and, you know, assume the position for the, the agents, which is, of course, training people into uh, accepting the authority of these so-called authorities. Um, I-, I think the TSA has always been the weak point of the DHS uh, uh, security apparatus that's been rolled out. And that was demonstrated back with that no-fly demonstration, that no, no-fly at uh, Thanksgiving, what was it, 2011 or whenever that was, several years ago now, where they, they gave up and they, they let everybody through. They, they closed down all the scanners and the screening and they just waved people through because they knew people were going to protest. And that is a weak point. It's exactly like the, uh, the, the, the GMO milk or whatever it is that, that, uh, that has that consumer aspect to it. They don't want to lose the customers. So if you make a fuss, they will comply. They will, they will go, go along with it. And so I think the TSA has always been a weak point. But as you say, they're going to try to use the judo move to, to say, oh, look, you know, it's falling apart. It's not working. We need more power. We need more agents. We need dogs that we can signal whenever we don't like the look of someone so that they'll bark and we can have an excuse to, to search them, that kind of thing. Um, so I think it could go either way at this point. And honestly, I think uh, a big TSA opt-out day, I mean, that's the type of thing that should be happening on a regular basis until they give up with this crap. Like, a yeah, it's Friday. It's opt-out day. That exa- like that, that relentless. James, you, I'm a pretty jovial guy, but I have to admit, I hate the airport with the white hot fury of a thousand suns, man. When I go to the airport, you must, and because I know what they're up to, I end up just sort of, yep, looking like a zombie. Uh huh. No, I'm not mad about any of the tyrannical things because I know how much worse it can get. It's like we've talked about before. It's almost like dealing with any kind of police. You're screwed from the moment the interaction begins. It's only a matter of how much more screwed you can actually get so let's actually kind of maybe count that in some ways that this push is coming as some bit of good news james will include more research from consumerist.com about new york and new jersey threatening to ditch the tsa now they noted some 20 or so airports that already don't use the tsa and of course it would be a whole other episode if we open up perhaps the pandora's box of private military contractors then at the airports But I would love to find out. I couldn't. I did just a little bit of searching what airports don't actually use the TSA. So hopefully people can use the show notes and the comment section below to add in a little bit of that info to help me out. Algebra terror delays Pennsylvania to New York flight, James, as a dark-skinned guy was furiously scribbling things. So some paranoid woman freaked out and complained about it, and they diverted the flight, and it turned out it was an Italian guy working on some math problems. So that gets to where 15 years of terror drills have instilled in some ways there's a terrorist under every rock and you have to panic about all of it. Although, to be fair, I'm sure a lot of people are scared of algebra. So there you go. Exactly. Some of the other headlines we are watching using hashtag New World Next Week. Emails from Clinton's IT director appear to be missing. 33 ill as nuclear waste leak continues at America's Fukushima. That's right. Just to the north of me in Washington State at Hanford. Former Facebook workers admit to routinely suppressing conservative news, and the Panama Papers are now kind of available online in a very shortened, redacted form. And, James, just as we started with Obama to Hiroshima, we'll end with Apple to China as Apple's Tim Cook heading back to China to meet high-level government officials. There's so much more news using hashtag New World next week, and I appreciate everybody that submits that news and everybody who supports independent alternative media. James? That's how it's all possible, and I want to thank all of my listeners and, uh, and supporters for hanging in there while I've been away for the last week or two with my new uh, girl, my new baby girl. And on that deep programming note, I'm going to be slowly getting things back online. We're still settling into a new routine here. It's going to be very interesting trying to do this with two kids running around or at least uh, crying around the house. So so it will be uh, it will be interesting, and you might hear more crying children in the background of some of these episodes. But hey, that's life. So uh, so as I say, I'll be getting things back online, and I'll be back with a subscriber editorial this weekend. So uh, look forward to that, and I'm looking forward to getting 